could touch me That would make me laugh so hard That the laughing and the crying were the same It felt so good beside him Seems he never spoke a word But now and then he chuckled Grace to you and peace from God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever or however you may be watching this particular worship service. We welcome you to St. Cloud, Minnesota. This is our online worship service. We do uh, provide a bulletin for those who like to follow along. The bulletin is located at our website, which is uh, on the bottom of your screen. Today we continue our sermon series exploring the book of Job. Uh, we'll uh, continue that series for uh, one more week. Also, we want to wish those of you who are dads today uh, happy Father's Day, and we uh, thank you for your ministry, not only in the church and outside, but in your own family. Uh, may God bless you. Friends in Christ, let us prepare our hearts and minds today to worship a holy God. Come before the Lord with joyful songs, because God is good and generous because we lack nothing. Serve the Lord with gladness because of his greatness and justice, because God puts an end to war and to all forms of violence. Come before the Lord with joy because he is faithful to his promises, because his word is eternal. Know that the Lord is God and we are his people, his community, his family. It is he who has made us to the praise of his name. And therefore today, in the same spirit, we have a festival to celebrate his peace. Let us pray. All powerful God, in Jesus Christ, you turn death into life and defeat into victory. Increase our faith and trust in him that we may triumph over all evil in the strength of the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. Please pray with me. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and but what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Please share the peace with someone near you or on the phone. Good Sunday morning to you kids. It's time for our time with young disciples. I actually won't be doing it this morning. You have a special group of guests that are here today. They're from Clearwater Forest. Uh, the camp counselors and a few of the staff are here. Uh, they were here to do some training and to be commissioned for active service this summer. Uh, Mark invited them down and we welcome them today. They'll be performing a few songs for you this summer. Enjoy. Holy God, that your word remains a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Old Testament lesson is Job chapter 14, verses 7 through 15. Both lessons today are from the book of Job. The first lesson shares hope for something that has seemingly been destroyed. At least there is hope for a tree. If it is cut down, it will sprout again. If its shoots will not fail. Its roots may grow old in the ground and its stems die in the soil. Yet at the scent of water, it will bud and put forth shoots like a plant. But a man dies and is laid low. He breathes his last and is no more. 
As the water of a lake dries up or a riverbed becomes parched and dry, so he lies down and does not rise. Till the heavens are no more, people will not awake or be roused from their sleep. If only you would hide me in the grave and conceal me till your anger has passed. If only you would set me, set me a time and then remember me. If someone dies, will they live again? All the days of my hard service, I will wait for my renewal to come. You will call and I will answer you. You will long for the creature your hands have made. This is the word of the Lord. The Old Testament lesson continues in the book of Job. Our second reading shares the hope of Job as he longs for a redeemer that will rescue him. Oh, that my words were written down. Oh, that they were inscribed with pen and with lead, they were engraved on a rock forever. For I know that my redeemer lives, and at last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, then in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for your presence in our lives. We ask today that your Holy Spirit would move among us, that we might discern your voice in your presence. May those things said that are true today be engraved upon every heart. May those things said that are false or even a bit misleading be quickly forgotten and cause no harm. Together we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. George Frederick Handel, the wonderful composer, uh, is buried at Westminster Abbey. In fact, uh, after his death, years later, there was a statue dedicated to his memory on one of the transepts of Westminster Abbey. That statue includes a statue of himself with a lifelike face. There's an organ above him on the statue. And there's a selection of music that's near that statue. And it's not the Italian operas he was known for. He's best known for the Messiah, or at least many people believe that. And on that sheet of music, on that statue, is the selection of music that says, I know that my Redeemer lives. And if you've ever heard the Messiah, you know that selection. I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the face of the earth. We get to that part of the book of Job today. It's an incredible understanding of hope in the midst of despair. And in Job chapter 19, we'll focus on that. We're looking at uh, the book of Job during these four weeks. I know it's almost impossible to go through 42 chapters in four weeks. But today we're going to look at uh, some of the dialogue that happens in the book of Job. In part one of our sermon series, we looked at the dialogue, excuse me, uh, the circumstances that led to Job's um, lament. Uh, the accuser and God challenge each other, and the accuser basically says to Yahweh, the reason that Job is so faithful is that you've given him everything. Take away some of the things, and we'll see how faithful he is. So in Job chapter 1, that's what happens. God allows the accuser to take away some things in his life. In Job chapter 2, God allows loathsome sores to be inflicted upon Job. So not only is he in misery because he's lost everything, but now he's in misery because he's in physical misery. And the dialogues, a series of dialogues begin to take place in Job chapter 3 and following. It's a series of dialogues between Job's supposed friends uh, and there's three of them in the text. Typically what happens in the book of Job, one person uh, reflects on a statement and then Job responds. 
Basically, Job's response is, I've done nothing wrong. Why is God doing this? And there's a lament. And there's this back and forth dialogue that's taking place. In the first dialogue, if you will, Eliphaz, a friend of Job's, accuses Job of wrongdoing. Somebody that's been punished this much, Eliphaz implies, simply has done wrongdoing. Job responds in a faithful and obedient way, most people assume. Another friend comes along. His name is Bildad. Bildad looks at Job and thinks the problem with Job is that he just needs to repent. If he'll repent, then God will fix what the problem is. The challenge for Job is what do I need to repent from? What have I done that requires repentance. The third friend comes along, his name is Zophar, and he implies that Job is guilty, much along the same lines as Eliphaz. Job is guilty of something. No one has this kind of punishment without being guilty of something. And we pick up our text in Job chapter 14, in this understanding that in the glimmer in the in the midst of despair and longing for relief job offers words of hope he says in job chapter 14 for there is hope for a tree if it is cut down that it will sprout again and that its shoots will not cease though its roots grow old in the earth and its stump dies in the ground yet at the scent of water it will bud and put forth branches like a young plant. In the midst of his suffering, in the midst of his own lamentation, if you will, Job offers a glimpse of hope here. And the hope comes in the form of nature. If you cut down a tree, eventually a bud will spring forth. Job has the capacity to hope even when life is not going his way. So when you continue in the book of Job, Job chapter 15, basically Eliphaz, we return to him. He basically says that Job is undermining religion. In chapter 17, Job prays for relief from this. He's praying for relief throughout the book of Job. In Job chapter 18, Bildad comes along and says, you know what? God punishes the wicked, so Job, you must be wicked. And in chapter 19, we get back to this hope that is referenced in the text. The hope is found in Job chapter 19. Actually, I would argue there's more hope than just chapter 19. In chapter 19, Job writes these words, or at least... Um, it's, they're attributed to him. Oh, that my words were written down, that they were inscribed in a book, that with an iron pen and with lead, they were engraved on a rock forever. So the words are meant to start out in a material form, and then they're uh, meant to be engraved upon a rock. So pay attention, basically, what Job is saying. These words last. They're enduring. Verse 25, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the face of the earth. And even after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. If you've ever been a part of a funeral service here at First Presbyterian, my guess is you've, he you've heard these words. They are hopeful words in times of loss, in times of grief, in times of despair. I know my Redeemer lives. Now the word Redeemer there, everybody wants to jump to the New Testament. That's not the reference here. Some translations even have it. I know that my Vindicator lives. There's a debate in scholarship about whether Job is seeking, <coughs> excuse me, seeking to be vindicated or to see God. The Redeemer here is uh, 
in Hebrew, the goel, the, the kinsman redeemer, we see this in the book of Ruth. It's someone who goes back to purchase, you, you purchase back someone who's been sold into slavery. Most people associate that text with, or the redeemer text with the life of Christ. That's fine, although I don't know if it necessarily goes there right away. But the point is, that Job is trying to discover who it is that will vindicate him from the condition that he's in. And he knows that God is a part of it. And what's his request? His request is to see God. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, then in my flesh, I shall see God. I find it amazing that Job can be hopeful through all of these circumstances. He has a capacity to hope that seems almost remarkable. And that's where I take the text. A lot of people think that the book of Job is a book about suffering and despair. There's, there is suffering and there, there is despair. Other people read the dialogues that happen between Bildaz, Eliphaz, and Zophar and think the book is about someone who's wrongly accused. That, that part's true as well. Today, though, we learn that the book of Job is also about hope. Hope in the midst of despair, hope in the midst of challenging circumstances. It's where we find ourselves today. How do we hope in light of what's going on in the world today? Where do we find our hope? Well, the text gives a clear answer. Job tells us, I know that my Redeemer lives. This past week, I spoke with two or three families about addictions within their family. I always tell people if I could snap my fingers at addictions, it would be a wonderful thing, but I can't do that. Because all of us want to fix what's wrong in addictions. And sometimes we're called just to walk alongside. One of the things that's almost universal about addictions is that at some point the family is in despair over what's going on. They can read the book of Job and see the despair and relate to it easily enough. And yet I see glimpses of hope in families. Glimpses where people hope that life can be changed. There can be a different ending to this story. Oftentimes I'm talking and praying with them in the most difficult times. But Job reminds us that we all have the capacity to hope because of what God has done in Jesus Christ. We can easily take those words and fast forward them to the New Testament and think to ourselves, that Jesus Christ has given us a capacity of hope that helps us in the journey. Let us be God's people this week, filled with hope over the circumstances of our world, but knowing that the Redeemer, the Vindicator, God still lives. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank you for your word and how it strengthens us for the journey. Guide us to honor you this week as we reflect on hope. Give us the capacity to hope for a new day, a new tomorrow, and in Christ, new life. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. I can only imagine 
what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine when my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to I can only imagine I can only imagine when that day comes and I find myself standing in the sun I can only imagine when all I will do prayers of the people take place in two locations today. One here is at the corner of 9th and University, a site of unrest uh, this past week, unfortunately. Uh, the other will be at the St. Cloud Police Department, another site of unrest in St. Cloud this week. I'm not here to make judgment on anyone or protesters or police. I'm here to pray for peace, and I hope that you will do the same. Before we do that, though, there are a couple of prayer requests that I would ask that you continue to be in prayer about. One is the Reverend Bill Yeal. Uh, Bill was hospitalized earlier. I would ask you to continue your prayers for Ron Peters. Ron was also hospitalized and we ask your blessing upon him. 
We also remember, continue to remember the family of George Floyd as all of us work uh, for peace and peacemaking in the world today. Friends in Christ, let us pray. Oh God, you created all people in your image. We thank you for the astonishing variety of races and culture in this world. Enrich our lives by ever widening circles of friendship and show us your presence in those who differ most from us until our knowledge of your love is made perfect in our love for all your children. Guide us all into the ways of justice and truth and establish among them that peace which is the fruit of righteousness that they may become the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that someday an arrow will be broken, not in something or in someone, but by each of humankind, to indicate peace, not violence. Someday, oneness with creation will be the goal to be respected. Someday, fearlessness to love and make a difference will be experienced by all people. Someday can be today for you and me. This we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.